Carter is a grad student uh, at the University of Montreal. Um, he was on our uh, or online organizing committee for this year's ca virtual CASCA meeting. And uh, so he's uh, very, uh, very uh, helpful to the community. And um, today he's going to be talking to us about a machine learning approach to Satel spectral analysis. Um, Satel is this uh, fabulous instrument at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope that generates huge amounts of data and seems like a, it's an ideal application of using uh, machine learning uh, advanced techniques to uh, to handle all that data. So I'll try not to embarrass myself anymore and Carter, it's all yours. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my desktop and we can get started. Okay, um, so thank you very much, Dennis, for the introduction. Um, as you said, I'm going to be talking today about the use of machine learning to Satel spectral analysis. Um, just as a little brief background, uh, I'm a master's student for one more day, tomorrow I start my PhD, um, at the University of Montreal. I work with uh, Julie chlabachek Landau in the group Extra. And this is work that I did when I was interning at the CFHT pre-COVID. Uh, with Laurie Prusson Nathan, Simon Prunet, Julie Chlavachek Lorando, my director, uh, and Sebastien Fabreau, who I see is here as well. Um, so, this paper was just accepted to Astrophysical Journals, our Astrophysical Journal, uh, two weeks ago, um, and it's been put up on the archives. You can see it there. I also have included, a, oops, that's not helpful. I've also included a set of kind of a manual of how we went through to do the machine learning and how to apply this machine learning um, at GitHub. You can see it at the bottom. It's under the Satel Signals page um, named Pomplemus. Uh, that's just a nickname for my cat. It doesn't stand for anything. Um, I just like my cat a lot. So, all right, well, let's get on with it. Uh, if it will get on. Great. So as an overview, first we're gonna talk about, well, what is machine learning? It's certainly a black box for most people, quite understandably, but I hope to demystify it a little bit. At least I would like to demystify neural networks, which is a very, very powerful and very popular algorithm for machine learning. We're gonna be talking a little bit about convolutional neural networks and how the convolutional part extends a normal neural network because that's what we used in this study. Uh, again, very popular algorithm in machine learning. On the science side of things, getting a little away from the comp side and computational part, we're gonna be looking at H2 regions. So discussing what are H2 regions, how are they formed, um, how do they emit radiation, and what, what might that radiation look like. Finally, we'll move on to Satel, um, the new instrument at, or well, relatively new instrument at the Canada France Wide Telescope, um, and also the Signals Project, which is a, um, a long-term survey using Satel. Then we're gonna talk about some of the results from applying machine learning to the Satel data, uh, namely the spectra. And finally, some conclusions and for further work So, what we plan on working on next. I don't know if you saw, but there was a Roman numeral one. This is the first paper in a series of three or four papers. We have yet to decide, um, but we're actually almost done with the second and third. So machine learning and astronomy. I'm sure everybody's heard the word machine learning. It's been coming up a lot. It's very popular. I pulled together some of my favorite machine learning papers um, that I've read recently. Uh, and you can see just from the titles that they cover a large breadth of different topics. So you can use it for astronomical imaging classification. You can use it for clustering in an unsupervised manner, um, different images. Uh, one of my favorite papers is this eigengalaxies paper where they construct eigengalaxies like eigenvectors um, to build other galaxies and they can use that for its predictive properties. It's quite fascinating. Uh, I put together this little graph just to give everybody a good demonstration of how popular machine learning is coming in astronomy. So if you, uh, if you go into archive and search machine learning in astronomy, uh, and you feel like plotting out the number of papers, this is what you'll see. So you can see that it's been exponentially growing um, significantly since about 2010. And in the last year, it's, it's truly blown up. Okay, so now that we have a little overview on why machine learning seems interesting in astronomy, let's, let's get into the actual weeds of what machine learning is in this context and what machine learning algorithms I'm using, or rather my collaboration has been using. Uh, so we're going to be talking about neural networks. If neural networks make you think of um, biology and how the brain works, that's good because that's what it's based off. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So there are a ton of neural networks. Um, and these are the base neural networks that you can have. 
We're certainly not going to discuss all of them. The only one I really want us to focus on is this multi-layer perceptron. Um, I love this image just because it shows the variety of neural networks. But the neural network that we're going to be using is relatively simple when you look at its architecture. So in blue, you have your input layer. That's whatever input you're going to be putting into the algorithm. Of course, you have these hidden layers, which is a, where a lot of that black box mystique of neural networks comes from. Calculations are going to be done there, and I'll describe what those calculations are. And then finally, you have an output layer. And I'll be showing some examples of what that might look like. But for a neural network, I like to think of it in seven relatively simple steps. Uh, easy to say the steps, a little harder to do the steps. So you're going to first collect your input data, uh, which can actually be a real pain. You need perfect or really, really good input data and take a lot of time to do the pre-processing. Then after you apply your input data, you're going to be applying a system of weights and biases at each one of those nodes in the hidden layers. That's what each one of those dots on the hidden layer um, represents or called nodes. You can see it here. Uh, at each node, after you apply those weights and biases and you sum everything up, you're going to be applying something called an activation function, which you choose a priori. We'll talk about that a little as well. And then finally, you're going to apply a cost function at the end. And your cost function, what it's going to do is say, okay, here's what my neural network outputs. And I know what the answer should be. And I want to minimize some cost function. So you want to see how well your network's doing with respect to the known outputs. Uh, in this scenario where you have known outputs, it's called a supervised machine learning um, algorithm because you're supervising your network because you know the final outputs. Great, so you've gone through it. That's the feed forward part. We're going to get back into that terminology in a minute. But what if it didn't do very well? Well, if it didn't do very well, then we're going to go through a system called backpropagation, which is not too terrible um, as long as you're not actually doing the math yourself. It's a ton of derivatives. So what you're going to be doing is calculating your derivatives to see which nodes have the most uh, variance. And you're going to try to minimize that. And when you're minimizing the derivatives, it's going to be with respect to that cost function. And backpropagation is the process in which you calculate those derivatives. And then you update those weights that are on each node. And then, of course, you iterate. See if you did any better. Um, reapply your cost function and go back and do that until you meet some certain threshold that you're okay with. So that's a really broad overview. Let's now go into each of the individual steps of how this neural network really works. So I break it up into two sections, and mo most people do. Um, I certainly can't take credit for this. You'll see that the source is Medium. Um, it's a wonderful site, uh, and towards data science, they have a lot of excellent articles, high-level articles on machine learning and other interesting data analysis techniques, and I suggest everybody take a look if they have more questions, or of course, write to me. So during the feed forward propagate, or the forward propagation, or feed forward step in your algorithm, this is perhaps the most basic neural network you could ever come up with. You have a set of inputs, you have a single hidden layer with a single node, and you have a single output. But it does a really good job of explaining how all other neural networks work, at least these types of neural networks. So you have your inputs, and for each input, you apply some weight to that input. And on your node, you're going to be summing up those weights with, for all of the inputs. So weight times the input for each one of those. And you're going to be adding some bias that you will choose. Um, or you can randomize it. There's a lot of different methods for that. And finally, you're going to be summing that up and applying some activation function. A lot of times, we use an activation function that ignores any negative values. So this is a really classic activation function that says if my after my summation of bias my node is positive then I will give it a value of one otherwise it gets a value of zero. That's just an example of it. So now we have our input data, we've applied our weights, sums, and biases, we've moved on and applied our activation function on our node, and finally we have the output. This is where we apply the cost function that we choose. It can be something like a, a mean squared error is very popular, mean absolute percentage error, it really depends on the problem. Uh, and of course, testing out to see which one works best for that problem. So you'll, you'll take a look at your output, see how it compares to the known truth, calculate whichever cost function you want. And the idea is now you want to minimize that cost function. So uh, let me give you just another look at some of the other activation functions. There are a lot of activation functions. Um, they all get used to different, uh, different amounts. Uh, one of the most popular ones for good reason, is called the ReLU function. Um, what it does is it sets any, if your node value is zero after you 
or your node value is negative after you do the summation and the address bias, it activates it to zero. So it sets your node to zero. Otherwise, it takes that value. Um, it's a very interesting activation function. I talk a little bit about it more in my paper and the visitations for it. Um, what it does is it allows you to introduce a level of nonlinearity into your network, which is Here's a very simple example of how you might put an input. So they're taking this image, transforming it into a vector. It gets placed into the input. And then you can see after your input gets filled in, it gets moved through the network. The white nodes are the ones that are being activated. And finally, you get an output where you calculate your uh, cost function. This is a nice classification problem. Uh, not always as easy as it looks. And I'll also point out here that those nodes between each layer, uh, there's something called fully connected, which means that each node in one layer is connected to all the other nodes in the layer right next to it. That's why you see all these crossing lines. All right, so once you've gone forward, you've, you've, uh, um, you have your input data, you applied your weights and sums, you've applied your activation function, and now you have your cost function to see how well you did. And now this is the point where we are actually training the algorithm. So that, that training step in machine learning is a step in which we go back and try to move those weights and biases a little bit uh, to try to optimize the algorithm to minimize our cost function. So here's um, a manifold that is meant to represent the cost function, and we would like to minimize the cost function. So how do we go about minimizing our cost function? Ah, yes, sorry, I would also like to mention, this is a really beautiful cost function, a really nice, there's a very clear minimum there. Uh, this is often what we're actually left with, very horrendous uh, minimization problems that can be incredibly difficult to solve. So how do you go, go about solving these problems? I apologize, not for the meme, but I apologize that math is coming. Uh, there's a little bit of math, but it's mainly just derivatives um, for everybody who remembers our optimization in Calc 3 or whenever you did it. So this, this back propagation step after we have applied our cost function and we see what our values are, what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna to wanna to go back and look at our nodes and see how those nodes change with our output and calculate those derivatives and how each node changes with other nodes because it's a fully connected system. So you're gonna be calculating all of those derivatives. And this is particularly important, the partial derivative of your error with respect to one of your weights. So this is your weight update equation. So our new weights are just gonna be the old weight minus some learning rate, which is a fun hyperparameter, which means it's a parameter you get to choose a priori and change if you want. Um, there is a large step involved to try to fine tune this parameter that happens later on. Um, but the important part here, it's the derivative of your error with respect to your weight. So you wanna see how your error is changing with respect to the weight of a node. And you do this for all of your nodes and use this simple formula to update it with new weights. That is that derivative calculation and back propagation step. Now we have new weights. So now we can go ahead and do that forward program or forward step again, the, the forward propagation and recalculate our cost function and see how we're doing. And we're gonna iterate that until you reach a certain tolerance. So that is a, a very kind of high level overview of how these neural networks uh, actually work for, for a very simple perceptron neural network. Um, I really like this. I think it's a nice diagram to bring you through. So the idea is you have your, you have, um, so step one, you randomly initialize all your weights. There's a lot of different ways to choose how to go about that. Um, and you apply your input function. You do that feed forward step where you move through your network and then you calculate your loss function. See how well you did. Um, then you're gonna be calculating derivatives of your error to try to do a better job, try to update your nodes. That's this back propagation step. Also updating your weights. And then you're gonna go through the same thing again. And you're gonna iterate this again and again, as step seven says, until you converge to some value in whatever loss metric you're using. So whatever your cost function metric is until you reach a certain threshold. Great, so we talked about neural networks, but what are convolutional neural networks? Well, as the name suggests, they are a convolutional layer or multiple convolutional layers plus a neural network. The convolution, convolutional layer does not work as a neural network. It is in fact the convolution that you know from uh, math if you had to take it then uh, in undergraduate or perhaps quantum mechanics, I'm sure you did some convolution there. 
But the idea in the convolutional step is you're going to convolve your input with something. We'll talk about that, a convolutional kernel. And there's normally a pooling step, which is a way that you can downsize the data, make it a little bit more manageable for the neural network. And really try to pick out the important pieces. So this whole convolutional layer piece came from image processing. Mainly convolutional neural networks have been used for um, uh, image problems, so image classification problems uh, in neural networks and in machine learning. And the whole idea of that convolutional neural convolutional layer before the neural network is to simply make the data, is to ignore the unimportant pieces of the data and find the important pieces. So I said there are two pieces. We have the convolutional part and then a pooling part. So what is convolution? Convolution is just a, a matrix operation. And the idea is you have your input image, you pick some convolutional kernel, and after you apply the matrix multiplication, you're gonna be getting something called a feature map. And the idea is you want that feature map to be representative of the most important features in the image. I have no idea what this animal is, but I love this demonstration. So they applied a convolutional kernel to the, kernel to the input image this guy, and you can see his feature map. You can see that it's really pulling out the big changes in that picture, the most important pieces of that picture. So that's the convolutional step. You can do this multiple times uh, to pull out different levels of important features. Then of course we have a pooling step. The pooling step in its most simple form, what it does is it takes a high resolution image and it, it pulls it, or it down samples it and it pulls it down to a smaller size. Of course, you're gonna lose information. Uh, this is a wonderful image um, that demonstrates this. So on the right, we have a normal high resolution image. And what they're doing here is they're taking little chunks, um, four by four chunks, and taking the max value within that chunk, uh, chunk of the image, and then taking that as the true value for that region. So this is the max pooling. Sorry, it's the max, not the average. This is a max pooling um, system. And you can see that it's, you're losing information, certainly, but there's a question of do you need all that information to actually answer the problem correctly? And is it perhaps introducing more errors into your neural network? So those are the two steps in a convolutional layer. When you pull together a convolutional neural network, what you're doing is you're taking your image or vector or whatever, it doesn't have to be an image. In our case, we're using spectra and you'll see that in a moment. Um, so you take an image, you can evolve it with the function that you choose a priori. You often then pool the image to make it smaller, lower the input vector. Again, this is not necessary. Then you're gonna take that and run it through your neural network like normal. So everything over here on the right side is just your normal perceptron neural network. It doesn't have to be a perceptron neural network, but that's what we use and it's definitely one of my favorites. I have a video demonstrating how these um, convolutional neural networks work. So on the right, you're gonna see an image. It's gonna go through several convolutional steps and then be passed on to the neural network to do the actual classification. Oh no, to do the actual classification. Maybe it won't work. Aha, okay. So as you can see, their inputs, they take an input, they convolve it, pick out the most important pieces, convolve it again to pick out some other pieces, convolve it again to try to see what's most important, and then pass it on to this dense layer, which would be your neural network, and finally an output. Um, this is a very rough image of what a convolutional neural network might look like. Okay, so now that we hopefully have a decent idea of how convolutional neural networks work, and if there are any questions on convolutional neural networks, I would suggest asking them now, um, or you can wait till the end, of course. But if there aren't any, then I'm just gonna go on. So onto the science side of things, right? We're all astronomers here, so where, where's the fun science? So we're looking at H2 regions. Um, H2 regions are regions of dust and gas, um, mainly in hydrogen and helium, a big surprise as the name suggests. There are also a significant amount of other metals in there, but those H2 regions are the images that you see from the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, that are absolutely fantastic and beautiful. Here's uh, Pillars of Creation, very, very popular H2 region. Um, here is Messier 20 or Trifid Nebula, uh, taken in multiple different wavelengths. And what you see and what's interesting about H2 regions is it's where stars are formed. These are the stellar nurseries that are so interesting. 
Um, a lot you can see in the visible, there's a lot of dust here that's obscuring, obscuring of infrared. Um, again, infrared nip. So this is pulling out some of the um, uh, UV, if I'm correct, looking at some of the, the star clusters. So how do H2 regions work? A uh, simple image for an H2 region is this one on the left. You have a cloud of dust and gas, uh, mainly comprised of hydrogen and helium with some other metals. You have a very bright uh, OB or B star or a globular cluster of OB stars at the center that are just born. So they're incredibly hot. They're radiating a ton. Um, they're letting out a lot of UV emission. That's going to affect that cloud of dust. Um, it's going to, and we'll talk about how this happens, but you have two different types of um, uh, photon emission processes that happen in the dust due to these ionizing photons coming from your central star or globular cluster. And what happens is you're going to have these nebular emission lines. And nebular emission lines are coming, that's that radiative signature coming from the cloud of dust. And that's what we are interested in when we use Satel, for instance. You can see these in the optical quite a lot. So what are those uh, radiative processes that lead to nebular emission lines? So keep in mind we're talking about a very hot, young OB star at the center of a massive cloud of dust full of hydrogen, helium, and some other metals. So there are two main ways to create those nebular emission lines or, those, or the resulting spectra that you might see in an H2 region. So of course we have ionization happening, right? We have our cloud of dust, we have our hot, hot star, it's emitting a ton of photons, and those photons are ionizing the dust and gas. But there are other electrons hanging out and those get recaptured by the, uh, the atoms, or in this case a proton in this example, in what is known as recombination. Those recombination lines are often found in hydrogen and helium, and it's really that capture of the electron. And when the electron gets captured, normally by a proton or a helium nucleus, it ejects uh, a photon uh, following normal quantum mechanics collisional uh, calculations. So the other main mechanism, so recombination mainly applies to your hydrogen and helium. The other main mechanism of emission lines in your nebula are going to be from ion excitation. Uh, I, I stole these fun images from Chris Morissette. Uh, I thought they were very appropriate for showing how ion excitation works. And the idea is uh, here in purple you have your, normally this is a metal nucleus. You have your metal nucleus or a metal atom that's missing an electron. It, there's a collision, so another electron passes very closely. And the, one of the electrons that's bound to the um, iron, or sorry, not iron, that's a that's common, but is bound to the metal, uh, it jumps an electron state, right? It gets energized and jumps state. Well, eventually, quantum mechanics tells that it's going to jump back down. It wants to be at its lowest state possible. When it jumps back down, it again releases uh, a photon. So those are our two main methods for generating uh, emission lines in nebulae. Okay. What do these H2 region spectra actually look like? I have two examples here, kind of the extremes I like to think of. One is incredibly metal poor on the left. You see it's 0.08 um, solar. O over H is a wonderful um, metallicity proxy, so oxygen or hydrogen. Over here for the nuclear ring, you see that it is approximately solar level metallicity. In both images, you probably note that H alpha is your strongest line or one of your strongest lines. That's very common. Um, some of the most important lines are H alpha. You have this N2 called a doublet. There's actually two peaks to it. Nitrogen and sulfur, is, that's actually a doublet hanging out there too, kind of hard to see. You have the other bomber lines such as H beta, uh, H gamma, H delta, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, they're over here. You get other important lines like helium. Um, and in oftentimes metal pore, you can see strong oxygen lines. You might be thinking, well, it's metal poor, so why do I have so much, why am I seeing oxygen that's a metal, especially an ionized metal? Um, unfortunately, it's not as simple as if you have a lot of oxygen, then you're gonna be seeing a lot of oxygen lines. It really matters on the density of those metals within your nebula and the temperature of the central star or globular cluster. So it's not a simple linear relationship, it's actually rather complicated. There are a number of excellent papers on that, by the way, by Chris Morissette, um, and he uses some uh, software that he has worked on developing called Cloudy. It's quite excellent. 
Okay, so now we have a basic idea of what happens with H2 regions, how they're ionized, what type of emission they might emit, uh, how we would see it in the optical which with H alpha, that N2 doublet, S2 doublet, and some other pieces. So let's get over to some instrumentation. So this is the instrument Sattel. Oh, I don't have an image of it, so this is not actually Sattel. Um, but Sattel uh, is, if you are familiar with Nicholson interferometers, it is very similar to that, but it is not the same thing. The base idea for Sattel is that it takes, it samples your wavelength, takes an interferogram, and then you can do a Fourier transform to pull out a spectra. And the power behind Sattel is that it doesn't just take a spectra for one location or on one band, it actually takes a spectra at each point um, in its viewing. So here's what we call Sattel data cube. In the X, Y axis, we have the spatial information. So here's a supernova remnant, for example. You have the spatial information. So you have a really beautiful image of whatever you wanna look at, in this case, supernova remnant. But you also, at each one of those pixels, have the spectral information. So at each pixel, you have a spectra, which is incredibly powerful. Um, Sattel's spectral resolution goes anywhere from approximately one to 20,000. Uh, the highest that's been used for observations is 7,000, and that's of the Perseus cluster. Um, and I, I actually have that data, and it looks quite exquisite at 7,000, but Sattel's real power comes from the fact that you're not just getting a spectra of a small region, and you're not just getting the spatial information, but you're getting everything, getting the spatial information and the spectral information. Um, so another important piece about Sattel to kind of make it different and distinguish it from other IFUs such as MUSE, um, Sattel has an 11 by 11 arc minute field of view, which is huge. Um, it, it's by far the largest field of view for any IFU. Uh, IFU stands for Integral Field Unit. That is the type of instrument that takes the 3D cubes. This work is done in part of the, as part of the SIGNALS collaboration. SIGNAL stands for Star Formation Ionized Gas in Nebular Abundances Legacy Survey. This is a multi-year, uh, about six-year program. They're on their third year at Sattel. Um, it is taking a look at over 40 galaxies and expected to find over 40,000 H2 regions. Um, here I have a beautiful image of M33, and you'll see why I chose M33 later. This is the central regions of M33, and then over here, this is the Sattel information from L33. After the spectral analysis, each color represents a different type of emission. If I remember correctly, blue is oxygen, and orange is N2H alpha. So it's a really fascinating type of information you can get from Sattel. Um, and signals is led by P.I. Lohi, um, uh, she is the instrument scientist um, for Sattel at this moment. So what kind of data are we looking at for signals? This was the test run for signals. Um, Sattel looks in three main filters uh, in the optical band. Uh, here, you can see the wavelengths here. Uh, the first optical filter, which is called SN1, uh, one of the main things you're going to pull out from SN1 is this O2 line. You have your second filter, SN2, uh, very original. You get these oxy this um, oxygen that's been excited three times, O3 and H beta. And then SN3, which is kind of the, the workhorse of Sattel, the main filter used, gets your H alpha, this N2 doublet, and your sulfur doublet. And sometimes helium one if you're very lucky. This is, these are taken at two different spatial or two different spectral resolutions, lower spectral resolutions for SN1 and 2 because they're less crowded. It's easier to find the lines and then do flux calculations, for instance. This is at resolution 600 for signals. Um, the actual program, the resolution is 1000 for SN1 and SN2. SN3 in this example is at 1800. In reality, it is at 5000 for the signals program. So it's truly exquisite data that we're looking at. And I'll show you an example of what one of these SN3 blocks look like. Great, so we've done our homework. We have a basic idea of neural networks and how convolutional neural networks work. Uh, we've seen H2 regions, we know how they're ionized. We kind of know what to expect um, as far as their emissions go. And we know what Sattel is, we know how it works, and we know what a normal Sattel spectrum might look like. So for this work, what we are going to be doing 
is we are going to be taking those SN3 filters of Satel, so the resolution 5000 with H alpha, your N2 doublet, and your S2 doublet. We're going to take the vector of fluxes as our input, and we're going to pass it through a convolutional neural network, which I'll describe in a bit. And the idea is to output the velocity and broadening parameters that are associated with that gas, that, that cloud of dust or gas that's being ionized. These are two really important parameters for a number of reasons. One, it's the kinematics of those H2 regions, um, which is incredibly important. Also, there is a wonderful software called Orcs uh, that is used for Satel data analysis. There is one pitfall of Orcs, and that is that you have to input an initial guess for velocity and broadening. If they are terribly wrong, you will get horrible fits. So this also goes around that problem and helps you get good initial guesses. Uh, and I'll also mention that it is being uh, changed a little bit to be the normal implementation in Orcs. So it's this machine learning problem. For everybody who's done machine learning, you know that the most important part of machine learning is your input set and really your training set. If you don't have a good training set, garbage in, garbage out. You're not gonna get anything meaningful out. So what we did is we created a set of synthetic SN3, so that third filter of Satel. Here is an example here. Uh, we modeled the H alpha, N2 doublet, and S2 doublet emission, added them up and added some noise. How did we come up with these amplitudes that we used? Well, we used the bond, um, calculate bond survey and bond calculations. It's a really wonderful um, survey and a really wonderful set of calculations that are done using Cloudy that are available on the 3MDB database. It's the Million Mexican Model Database handled by uh, Christophe Moisset. Uh, here are some of the parameters if you're, if you're interested. I'm not going to go into those, but you can find them more in the paper. And next, we wanted to make sure that our data was, or that our, our training set was pretty well um, broken down into different velocities and different broadening, right? If we want to train our algorithm to pick out the velocity and broadening parameters, we want to make sure that we have a good amount of broadening velocity parameters that it's learning from. Uh, you can see here that everything's pretty even. We have a good number of broadening and velocity parameters and the test validation and training set are all relatively homogenous in that regard. The convolutional neural network that we use here is absolutely not my own. This is taken um, from Fabro et al, 2018. Thank you, Sebastian. And the idea is we start off with our spectra uh, that is our, uh, it's not an image of a spectra, just to be clear, this is the, the vector of um, amplitudes for our spectrum, for SN3 spectra. We run it through two layers of convolution. The first layer is just to pull out the main features, and the second layer is to pull out some of the more fine structure in the spectra. And then we pool it, to, to, we just use uh, max pooling to downsample a little bit and make the input smaller. That's that feature extraction or the convolutional step of a convolutional neural network. Uh, we then need to flatten it. That's just a, a neural network fun part. You have to have it as an input vector. We do something called dropout. Dropout is a way that you can get around overfitting, which means if you're overfitting, that means your network is learning your training set really well, but will not generalize to other things at all. So one way to get around that is adding a dropout layer. And a dropout layer means you're randomly throwing away pieces of input. So your network doesn't learn from those pieces of input. And that actually changes each iteration. Then we have our two fully connected layers. First one contains 256 nodes, second one 128 nodes, not super important. But the, that's our neural network step. This is a regressional problem. So finally, we're gonna be calculating our velocity and broadening. Forgot to change that typo. It should say velocity, not temperature. And we use linear activation function to determine your broadening and your velocity. So how does this look when we do it? We have our set of, we have our training set. We train our convolutional neural network that I just showed. By the way, the training set has about uh, 24,000 mock spectra that we've created. We train our network till we're happy with it, and then we apply our test set. Um, our test set is, uh, is 3,000 of those spectra that we held off. The network has never seen our test set. That's the whole point. It has no idea what it looks like after we train it. Then we give it to them and see how well do they do. Or how well does it do? How well does our neural network recover the base parameters from our test set? And once again, our test set is more synthetic data. So what we see for the velocity 
Um, we're incredibly happy with the velocity. You can see here, here's a residual density plot. Um, so this yellow means higher density of those residuals over a set of velocity parameters of your velocity, which means the residuals are low. You can see here, this is a residual density plot. Um, so it's basically the errors on your velocity with the standard deviation of approximately five kilometers per second, which is very good, very comparable. In fact, orcs gets about three kilometers per second if you have the perfect guesses for everything and everything's set up wonderfully. So it's very comparable to the main fitting algorithms uh, used for Satel data cubes. Broadening is admittedly a little bit worse. Um, the standard deviation drops, or actually increases to about 5.7 kilometers per second. Um, we can see here, and this is mainly why there's this large tail for low broadening. Uh, at high broadening parameters, we're doing a pretty good job. You can see this yellow region's uh, really around zero. But really above 20, we start, uh, really below 20, we're not doing too well. Um, or we, this is something that we will probably be looking at additionally later. Uh, but one of the main reasons is likely, how to put this, it, it's likely tied to our training set, uh, something wrong with the broadening. It's also potentially an issue with Satel. Um, Satel, even at high resolution, actually can't distinguish um, uh, broadening parameters lower than approximately 14 kilometers per second. So as far as Satel data goes, we're really right about here, and that's when we start to see some pretty good results in our broadening parameter estimations. Great. Uh, we, we've tested it, we, we've trained our network, we've tested our network. The network shows us that we're doing pretty well, uh, certainly comparable, a little worse, but comparable to the main fitting techniques. But we kind of need a sanity check at this point. How do we know that our network's actually learning the important pieces that we want it to learn? Meaning, how do we know that it's looking at that H alpha line, the N2 doublet and the S2 doublet, and learning from the structure of those and the related structure of those, how the broadening and velocity parameters are gonna be changing? What we did is we created an activation map. An activation map looks at how your inputs affect your output. So basically it's telling you what's important in your input for the final output. And we see here with uh, the relative weights in this activation map that they, the weights are centered on the H alpha and N2 emission and also your S2 emission, which is perfect. That's just a sanity check to make sure that our neural network's not learning from all this noise in between those peaks, but is really focusing on those peaks not just the peaks, but also the area in, uh, in between the immediate peaks. Great, so it works. Uh, we feel comfortable that it's looking at something that it's supposed to uh, in the input set and the input um, vectors. We trained it and we know it works well in test data, but how about real data? That's always, that's always a little different. So we took a, or we took a Satel cube from the signal survey this is N33, and this is called the seventh field of N33. You can blame Lori for the naming of that, but this is what the deep image of Satel looks like. So if you take that data cube and compress it, um, so no more spectra, this is what, what it would look like. You can see that there are a lot of different um, H2 regions here, not necessarily classical H2 regions like you have here, but you also have supernova remnants and planetary nebulae. So we applied our neural network to, to the spectra at each pixel um, in the Satel cube, right? Each pixel has a spectra, so we apply those to our neural network. And what do we see? For the, these are the velocity residuals. Uh, we see that they're not terrible, but there is a obvious systematic structure in the residuals where at the bottom, uh, it's overestimating, near the middle, it's doing a really good job, getting the right value, and at the top, it's not doing such a good job. And I'll also mention that these residuals are calculated as the difference between our neural network and the standard fitting procedures um, for Satel. Well, uh, there's a fun thing about Satel, and I'm only mentioning this because everybody who does machine learning gets really excited, but you have to remember if your training set's not perfect, you're gonna have some problems. Um, the Satel resolution is not actually constant. It changes a little bit um, as you move from the bottom of the cube to the top of the cube. We sampled from the center. So we sampled that resolution of 5,000 from the center. So we actually had to go back and retrain our network on data that has varying resolution of around 5,000. What happens when we do that? Things get taken care of when we do that. When we do that, 
we no longer have the systematic, and you can see that our, now our velocity residuals are much lower in regions of strong signal to noise, so where there's a lot of data uh, and a lot of flux, which is wonderful. So this is showing us that, yes, we can actually use our neural network now for real to tell data to get these velocity and broadening estimates. These are the final maps for velocity and broadening. Uh, you'll notice that, once again, broadening isn't doing quite as well as the velocity is doing. Um, there are some known systematics that we discussed in the paper. It's mainly due to the fact that we believe there are multiple network wasn't trained with those, so it's not going to be able to handle that. Once again, it's in the paper, or you can ask me after this if you want more information. But these are our final, final broadening and velocity uh, residual maps for that, that M33 field um, of our Satel cube. Okay, so we have a, a neural network method that we, we've tested. It works well on synthetic data and it works well on real data. But why would we use this over the normal fitting procedures? Well, two reasons. One, like I mentioned, works the standard fitting procedure requires you to have broadening and velocity estimates that are good. This will give you your good broadening velocity estimates. Otherwise, it's truly a wild guess that you have to make and see until you get it right. The other main benefit is the time reduction. Machine learning is wonderful for bringing down the calculation time. Citel um, has approximately 4 million pixels. It's about 2,000 by 2,000. So you have a total of 4 million pixels, and you have, in this case, a, five th a resolution 5,000 spectra at each one of those pixels. As you can imagine, that takes an incredible amount of time. Even if you bin the pixels at 8 by 8, and eight, by eight regions, uh, it takes approximately four hours on one of the computing clusters at Canada France Wide Telescope. The machine learning algorithm, on the other hand, takes only two minutes to do that exact same region. Uh, uh, so if we don't bin it and just look at the raw Satel image, raw Satel cube, it takes approximately 10 days to fit that entire cube using standard methods. Uh, using machine learning algorithm, it takes less than four hours. Uh, and this, these are the calculations um, unparallelized. The normal code is that, or the standard methods are parallelized, and machine learning, it is parallelized, but I'm, I'm giving the unparallelized hours. And it, it reduces linearly. So if you have two cores, it'll take half the time, so on and so forth, approximately. Okay, so a little bit of an abrupt ending there, but that is um, our first step at a machine learning approach to Satel spectral analysis. As I mentioned, this paper was just accepted to Astrophysical Journals. You can find it there in the archive, and we will be working on some more papers applying machine learning to Satel Spectre. Uh, that's it for me, um, and if there are any questions, I would love to take them. Thank you, Carter. Very nice presentation. Oh, you, you led us through the whole path of, of things and how machine learning works, and then uh, through the actual science and getting uh, some results out from Sitel. Um, so if you have questions, uh, you can just uh, raise your hand in the participants window, type them in the chat window. Um, either way will work. Um, so a uh, uh, question I have is how many uh, Sitel data cubes will signals end up with? I think right now they're shooting for 50. No, 60. Sorry, they're shooting for 60. Um, so this is going to be really helpful on getting velocity and broadening for those 60 data cubes rapidly. Right now, they, we have approximately 30 of it. And I should mention I'm part of the Signals collaboration. Yeah. Okay, Blake, you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk, Carter. Uh, it's good to see your, your research. Um, I had a question about kind of at the start when you were talking about the neural networks and you mm -hmm. had that step where you were including the weights and, and plus or minus some bias. Yes. Um, what would be like an observational bias that you would be like a real life bias that you could be including at that step um, when you're changing your weights? Yes. Your so normally the bias is actually just a numerical um, artifact that we'll be adding to shift the node value. Yeah. Um, I don't know uses of I know you can use real biases from systematics. I haven't seen much of that incorporated into neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, with my little archive plot, you saw that neural networks in astronomy are really, or machine learning in astronomy is really starting to blow up. Yeah. And I think we're going to see that introduction of systematics more into the networks themselves at a later point. 
Yeah, interesting. But the idea is right now you want to take care of the systematics and the pre-processing of your test set or training set as best as possible. Yeah, cool. All right, thanks. Thank you. James, you have a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Carter. Uh, that was a really nice talk. Thank you very much for sharing with us today. Um, so my question is regard with the, the method that you've used here. Um, so um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I have a, or I had a student named Jared Cowan who also developed a convolution neural network for determining the kinematics of gas. Um, and in his case, it was for um, GBT data that we obtained um, of ammonia. And yes, uh, that was with that paper, and we, we discuss it actually in ours. Um, okay, I, I just wondered, could you, could you elaborate a bit about the differences between what you've done here and what my student did um, for his from convolution? What I remember, absolutely. So from what I remember, the, the data um, was a, of a much higher resolution. And in that case, if I remember correctly, you're looking at uh, disentangling multiple components that you might see uh, in radio mm -hmm. spectra. Right, so that yeah. disentangling radio component or disentangling multiple components in a radio spectra, and I, for everybody else, let me pull up a slide really quickly. Um, that's absolutely something that we want to tackle uh, with this approach for Satel. Um, the idea behind these multiple components for everybody is if I'm an observer looking at a H2 region or whatever, um, depending on where I'm looking, I will be seeing different pieces of the gas, and depending on my resolution, I will. I might be seeing those different pieces of the gas. So it's, for instance, I'm looking right through the middle of this um, wonderful, wonderfully spherical H2 region. I have a piece coming towards me and a piece going away from me. If I have high resolution, I can disentangle those two. If I have low resolution, I cannot disentangle those two. Um, if I remember correctly, the data in um, Jared's case was a little bit higher resolution than we normally see on Satel. So you were actually able to do a decent job of disentangling these um, uh, these two resolved lines. So, unfortunately, with the lower resolution of Satel, normally we're in this low resolution scenario. Not always, of course, but oftentimes mm -hmm. we are. Um, you need to go, at least for Satel, closer to 7,000 or 8,000 um, spectral resolution to actually be able to see the two lines. Okay. Um, that being said, we are very interested in one of the last, or the last paper that we plan on working on, on this, is to see if we can't train a neural network to disentangle these lines. Or at least give us an indication if we can disentangle these lines. Um, if, can I ask a follow-up question, uh, Dennis? Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Um, so the, just the, the data that you showed where you had the fit, um, was that a, of, a, of a single line or, or was it uh, one of the, the three uh, settings where you have multiple lines? I wasn't clear to me if it was H alpha or oxygen. Uh, sorry, so we're looking at the we're looking at H alpha, the N2 doublet, and the S2 doublet. So we're looking at all those lines that are apparent in the third filter of Satel. Okay. The higher resolution five thousand Satel. So my question so, is, uh, my my later question is, um, <laughs> what I, I can see that that that's another layer of complexity added to the situation because you might have different lines at different heights. Yes. Um, is, how do you how do you account for that? Like, how do you train your um, network to account for that extra uh, complexity? I mean, you, you could almost so have an infinite amount of different. Uh, well, maybe not infinite, but yes. you could have a quite a wide range of different uh, inputs for having different lines of different. Um, yes, you can have significantly different inputs. And your H alpha, even though in my examples it was always the strongest peak, is not in fact always your strongest peak. Sometimes the N2 doublet um, it has a higher flux than H alpha, which means, as you're suggesting, template fitting in the scenario would not work very well. Yes. Um, which is exactly why we're using a neural network. What we do is we, we normalize our data to the peak in SN3, whether that's H alpha or N2. We tried um, normalizing it to other peaks as well, uh, and we found that as long as it was either the max peak or H alpha, we get um, consistent results. I'll also mention one very lovely and annoying thing about Satel. Uh, Satel, if you take a look at it, if you, you pick a line, uh, this is H alpha for example, mm -hmm. you're not gonna come up with a beautiful Gaussian. That's not the, the response for Satel. It's actually the sync Gauss function. And you see these lobes here, um, they're incredibly important and they're affected strongly by your velocity and broadening. So it's not as simple. 
to just look at the main peak, you actually have to understand what's happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that also sets it aside, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, a little bit from um, uh, Jared's paper. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jared, you're next. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Jared, I'm the student yes. that James was uh, referring to that worked on the, the Clover paper. But uh, yeah, I just had a, a question about um, why you didn't include the, the brightness of the emission lights as an additional output. Because if you look at your um, saliency map, it already looks like the, the network is using those peaks. So it seems like a, a natural follow through to just go ahead and uh, add the, the height of the emission lines as an additional output. I know so I think the, you, you had planned to do that later, but I'm just curious why you didn't add it onto this network. Yeah, why, why not predict the, the height of the emission lines as well? So you've asked the perfect question. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we weren't adding the height to the emission lines initially. Uh, one of the main things is that they're all normalized. So even if we get the height of the emission lines, that doesn't necessarily give us a flux. We have to know a base flux to denormalize from. Um, uh, that can bring up another question of, uh, another really important piece um, in H2 regions, in the study of H2 regions, is to look at line ratio fluxes. So the ratio of the flux from, let's say, H alpha to an N2 doublet. Normally it's the other way around, but that's okay. Um, that's exactly what we're doing in our second paper, uh, which is at a very mature stage. Um, so it should be sent in for, for publication sometime soon. Uh, within the next, with sometime at the end of September, I bet. Um, Satel, again, is a little tricky because as I showed, it has that sink gauss function. So some of that flux is held in those lobes of your sink gauss function. So it's unfortunately not as simple as just looking at the peaks. Um, you can't just get the amplitudes and then take those ratios to get those real line ratios. You actually have to take the fluxes. So we are using another neural network, this time not a convolutional neural network, just a normal neural network uh, to tackle that problem of line ratios. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Of course. Toby, you have a question. Hey, thanks. Um, and great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm not expert in this but it's my understanding that with, with this type of stuff you, you really get out what you put in uh, and you you kind of touched on this throughout the talk and spoke a bit about it but i was wondering um if you could sort of encapsulate just how uh, much the choice of your training set or whatever you're training your network on really impacts your results and also if like down the line when you make say the code public or, or you want other people to use it, would they be choosing their own training sets or would this be something you would set and it's like hard coded in? Okay. Um, so you're, yeah, I think you summed it up perfectly. And there's an old adage, garbage in, garbage out. Um, if your training set isn't good, it doesn't matter how perfectly tuned your neural network is or whatever machine learning algorithm you have, if your inputs are garbage, your output is going to be garbage all day. There's a lot of fun memes about that. Um, so your input obviously matters quite a lot. It took us a very long time. And actually the, one of the hardest things to do in this project was coming up with the kind of perfect um, input, the perfect synthetic data, which is why we were so careful and tedious when choosing, for instance, the bond simulation to pick out our amplitudes uh, for those different emission lines. Bob, Bond simulation has, uh, has a lot of success um, in doing a good job of replicating observations. Uh, as for in the future people using um, and building their own training sets and, and, and using this neural network for their own data, um, it has been trained for multiple different resolutions uh, just for Satel. So a user has an option of picking the resolution they want and simply typing it in and then you know, running through the code. Um, and I, there's an example, IPython notebook in the GitHub repository that demonstrates how we build the synthetic data set. So if people need to tailor a synthetic data set slightly to their problem, they'll be able to build their own. And there's also a notebook that shows you exactly how to retrain our algorithm. So 
so that users can go back, tweak for their exact case, rebuild the network and, and, and use it from there. Oh, nice, that's good. And then, sorry, just one follow-up. So you, you built this for Citel, but presumably you could use it for other IFU, right, or IFS? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. We've been talking uh, with the people at Muse about using this um, as well. And it right. would, oh, that's great. it's the same idea. You just want to train it on data that's specific for a little more specific for Muse. So the resolution, and you also want the instrument response for Muse. Uh, when building the synthetic data, we use the exact instrument responses to tell, which is why it's a little more tailored sure. towards the tell because of those weird side lobes that drive everybody nuts. Yep. Sounds good. Great. And another reason why we put those IPython notebooks and everything online, uh, I think they're pretty well documented, is because we want people from other instruments to go through and simply train a little differently, build a different training set, and then be able to use this algorithm directly on their data. So it's tailored for them. So Carter, I have a question. Uh, is this being, uh, will be utilized by the Signals project, uh, replacing the, the standard reduction code, or how will it actually be utilized in practice? So it's, uh, we haven't decided if we're gonna use it to, to calculate our velocity and broadening parameters instead of the standard methods. It's absolutely going to be used to calculate the priors that are necessary for those standard methods. Um, so that's actually being, I'm working with the ORCS team at University of Laval to incorporate that into their standard pipeline. Um, we are also working on some other things, like I mentioned, we're working on the line ratios. Um, and we're actually seeing really wonderful performance on that. Uh, and that will very likely take over as the main mechanism for cal calculating line ratios uh, for the signals project. I can't Great. say for sure, but that's uh, is certainly something we're thinking about. And Blake has a question. Yeah, sorry, uh, thanks. I hope I can ask one more quickly before we end up. But sure. um, Carter, when you were showing your about your final um, residuals, and you were you went from like the negative thirty to positive thirty spread to just having uh, the positive zero to twenty. Um, yes. Was that map on the right also the residuals, or is that just the velocities that you obtained? Uh, I'm sorry, that's also the residuals. Um, so that's for I, after it, it you kind of shifted resolution to have like that normalized baseline, right? That's correct. So does that, is there an implementation of like a positive bias then in your, um, in your new velocity yes. resolution? There is. This image is a little misleading because this is absolutely, on the right-hand side, it's the absolute value of those residuals. So okay. Of course, they're always going to be positive. Okay. But when you look at the non-absolute value, yes, there is a slight bias towards positive velocities. Okay. The reason why we chose to have the absolute values here and not here is because we wanted to show the systematic spread yeah. and how it really changes from negative to positive. Um, but yeah. yes, there's an overall systematic uh, uh, positive, like uh, we're overestimating the velocity slightly, but yes, there, there's a trend. And that's just like a result of the network or just? Uh, we think it is a result of the network. Um, another issue is that the signal to noise ratio, so even though we have high resolution, the signal to noise varies drastically throughout the cube. Mm -hmm. um, here we've done some masking to only pick out high signal to noise regions, but here where you have the yellow, um, so the, the worst residuals, that, yeah. actually correlates per, oops, that actually correlates perfectly to um, low uh, signal to noise, Yeah, the worst data. So there is a very strong correlation between bad data, or not as optimal data, bad signal to noise, and you know, worse estimates. But yeah. in these high signal to noise regions, the errors are normally within a couple kilometers per second. Right. Cool. Or fractions. Okay. Yeah. Thanks Thank so you. much. Appreciate it. And one quick question for me. What is your PhD thesis on? Uh, uh, my PhD thesis, uh, instead of just a project, it's more of a theme. Um, so the idea is to use machine learning techniques in the future of optical and x-ray astronomy. I have another paper that just got accepted actually right before I started this talk um, on using another machine learning technique called principal component analysis to disentangle multiple temperature components in X-ray spectra. Um, so I'm gonna be doing some follow-up work with that, with the people at um, C of A. Excellent. Thanks again for a very, very well presented talk, very interesting subject and something that I think we'll hear a lot about in the future, more machine yes, learning. So. And we'll definitely be, be there. So uh, thanks again. And uh, 
everybody. The next Canvas talk will be in two weeks. Next week is Labor Day, so uh, two weeks from now we'll be at the same time, same place. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much, Carter. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Carter.